Hi, I'm Kenan Ong, and I'm going to talk today about transport. I'd like to thank Ricky Mosley, who did the road transport analysis this year. What am I going to be talking about today? I'm going to be talking about the scenarios and how they affect transport, the assumptions driving how transport is modelled in the scenarios. I'm then going to talk about some interesting aspects this year, so smart charging and vehicle to grid, peak electricity demand, and autonomous or self-driving cars. Finally, I'll do a recap and then talk about the key uncertainties. Hydrogen and electrification are key to the decarbonisation of transport. Even in the slowest decarbonising scenario, there are no new cars sold with an internal combustion engine after 2040. Total energy demand for road transport falls in all scenarios due to the efficiency of electric motors and fuel cells. Public transport is important. In leading the way, vehicle to grid could provide up to 38 gigawatts of flexibility from 5.5 million vehicles. This varies significantly by time of day and time of year. For example, at winter peak, we're assuming between 5 and 6 p.m., 19 gigawatts might be available in leading the way. Aviation, marine and rail also require significant change on the road to net zero. Continued use of fossil fuels would require carbon offsets. Now that I've covered the key messages, I'm now going to put things in context and talk about today. In 2019, there were 38 million road vehicles consuming 440 terawatts of fuel. These accounted for 24% of the UK's annual carbon dioxide emissions of 480 million tonnes. In phase 2020, our scenarios are defined across two axes. The vertical societal change axis describes the extent to which transport changes from today, from how we travel to what fuels are used. Low on the axis represents low societal change. High on the axis represents high societal change. The horizontal speed of decarbonisation axis describes how soon the 2050 net zero target is met. Steady progression misses the net zero carbon target by 2050, and the other scenarios achieve it, leading the way achieving it around 2045 in transport. Talking about what the actual scenarios mean for transport, in grey, bottom left, we have steady progression. In this scenario, the 2050 target is missed. Although decarbonisation progresses, fossil fuels are still used for heavy transport by 2050 due to low carbon costs. Moving along, in blue, we have system transformation. In this scenario, 2050 is met on time. Hydrogen is widely available for heavy transport, and most cars are electrified. In gold, consumer transformation, just above system transformation, 2050 is also met on time. Road transport is more electrified as less hydrogen is available for heavy transport, and there are more electrified trucks and buses in this world. In green, leading the way, 2050 is met early, around 2045 for road transport. Road transport uses both electricity and hydrogen. I'm now going to talk about steady progression in more detail in a grey box on the right. This grey box summarises the key assumption in steady progression. Sales of purely petrol and diesel cars are banned in 2040. Heavy goods vehicles and buses run on diesel, green gas, electricity and hydrogen, reflecting low societal change from today and low carbon prices. Also reflecting low societal change from today, autonomous self-driving cars appear from the 2030s, but adoption is low. Public transport usage changes very slowly from today. Next, I'm going to talk about system transformation. In system transformation, the net zero target is met on time. Sales of petrol and diesel cars are banned from 2035, in line with government announcements in 2019. Heavy transport is fueled mostly by hydrogen and some electrical vehicles. Reflecting higher societal change, self-driving cars are adopted from the early 2030s. Public transport usage grows faster than today. A good proportion of vehicles are charged at forecourts, less disruptive than digging up all residential streets and akin to the petrol filling station model we're used to today. I'm now going to talk about consumer transformation. 
In consumer transformation, the net zero target is met on time. Again, sales of petrol and diesel cars are banned from 2035, in line with government announcements in 2019. Heavy transport is fueled mostly by hydrogen, but more electric vehicles, as there is less hydrogen available. Reflecting higher societal change, self-driving cars are adopted from the early 2030s. Public transport uses grow significantly faster than today. Most cars are charged at home, and this requires widespread street works. Consumer transformation in gold and system transformation in blue differ in the availability of hydrogen, the adoption of public transport or self-driving cars, and levels of home charging. I'm now going to talk about leading the way. In leading the way, road transport reaches net zero early, around 2045. Sales of petrol and diesel cars are banned from 2030, a possible result of government consultation. Heavy transport is fueled mostly by hydrogen and some electric vehicles. Reflecting the highest levels of societal change, self-driving cars are enthusiastically adopted from the early 2030s. Public transport usage is also significantly higher than today. Most cars are charged at home, and this requires widespread street works. I'm now going to briefly talk about non-road transport. This year, we modelled non-road transport for the first time. The box on the right summarises our modelling. Some or all of these outcomes will most likely require carbon offset. Rail is mostly electrified with some diesel in steady progression and, and some hydrogen in system transformation. Aviation is fuelled by fossil and biofuels. In maritime shipping, fossil fuels may still be used internationally with a mix of ammonia and biofuel in the UK. Next, I'm going to talk about the modelling. Showroom to scrappage lifetime costs are modelled for all forms of road transport. The lowest cost choice for the vehicle owner is favoured in each scenario. Aviation and marine shipping is modelled based on the Committee for Climate Change's report 2019 Net Zero Technical Report. Heavy vehicles are currently fuelled by diesel with some biodiesel. By 2050, this will have to change. The following chart shows the fuel mix in 2050 and I'm going to highlight two scenarios. On the left, in consumer transformation, hydrogen in blue is favoured due to low carrying and range requirements. Electric trucks in gold are a notable proportion of the fleet, but these vehicles are more expensive. Whereas on the right, in steady progression, this scenario favours fossil fuels in grey and green gas in dark blue due to lower costs. Next, I'm going to talk about where people are assumed to charge their vehicles. Where will people charge their electric vehicles? Where people charge has an impact on peak demand and networks. Smart charging is easily done at home, where it can happen around lifestyles. Or we might use rapid charging forecourts in the same way we use petrol stations today. However, on full courts, we prioritise rapid fill and a short delay before going home or to work. Home charging or full court charging will impact peak demands and the level or street works required. In the next table, I'm going to talk through two scenarios. In consumer transformation, 79% of vehicles charge at home, whereas 21% charge in public or at work. In this world, smart charging is more readily accessible due to levels of people charging at home. On the other end of the scale, we have system transformation in blue. In this world, 41% of cars are charged at home, whereas 59% are charged at four courts or at work, the other end of the scale. In all scenarios, heavy goods vehicles and buses are charged at public or at workplaces. Let's look in more detail at our smart charging and vehicle to grid assumptions. Smart charging and vehicle to grid potentially have a significant effect on peak electricity demand. There are potentially enormous benefits for millions of car owners. Smart charging allows consumers to avoid peak prices. It allows people to take advantage of renewable energy like wind and solar when it is available. This works when a time of use tariff is combined with automated charging 
more controlled with a mobile phone. Vehicle to grid. The idea of using your car as a two-way battery to avoid peak prices, take advantage of low prices, and maybe sell electricity back to the grid or your neighbours at peak times when it's more expensive. This could reduce your own customer bill. It could also reduce network investment and generation investment, which could reduce consumer bills for everybody. There is lots of uncertainty in both these areas. The next graphic shows our assumptions for adoption of smart charging tariffs and vehicle to grid by 2050. Starting on the left, we have smart charging. Smart charging follows the societal change axis assumption. In grey, steady progression in the bottom middle shows that just over half of drivers might smart charge their vehicles at 54%. Just above it in green, leading way, has the highest level with 83% of drivers smart charging. The other scenario is at various points between these. On the right, vehicle to grid. Vehicle to grid also follows the societal change axis. We've assumed vehicle to grid chargers cost more than the standard ones and will be available at scale from the late 2020s. At the bottom right in grey, steady progression has the lowest option at 5%. Just above this is leading away in green with the highest adoption at 45%. The picture highlights the future uncertainty around these trends. We have a lot higher range reflecting feedback from FES 2019. Smart charging and vehicle to grid could significantly reduce peak demand, and these concepts could reduce network and generation investment. So how does this all look on a cold, dark winter evening? On my next slide, some context. Peak electricity demand is to traditionally during dark winter evenings, 5 to 6 p.m., due to the overlap of workplaces closing and household activity increasing as we cook, heat, or light our homes. Current peak electricity demand on the distribution and transmission system totals around 60 gigawatts. Electric vehicles add significant demand to the electricity system and will influence investment and operational decisions in the decades to come. On my next slide, I'm going to show you the effects of electric vehicles on the system peak. Let's look at steady progression first on the left. The horizontal axis helps to show peak electricity demand from electric and commercial vehicles between now and 2050. The vertical axis shows the electricity demand from these vehicles in gigawatts on the left. The dotted grey line shows what electric vehicle peak demand would be without smart charging and vehicle to grid at around 20 gigawatts. The dashed grey line shows peak after smart charging, reducing peak from 20 gigs to around 13 gigawatts. The solid grey line shows that vehicle to grid in 5% of drivers further reduces the peak to 9 gigawatts. Let's look at a high case consumer transformation. The dotted line shows that peak demand might get to around 22 gigawatts in this scenario. The dashed gold smart charging line could reduce this to 10 gigawatts. From the late 2020s, electric vehicles might be working like two way batteries, supplying electricity from homes and public charge points. In this scenario, vehicle to grid in just 26% of drivers could actually turn electric vehicles into a net supply of electricity. At peak, they could provide up to 10 gigawatts, shown on the negative axis in this chart. I'm now going to talk about autonomous self-driving cars. There has been significant development in this area over the last few years. Reports indicate significant potential benefits for consumers. These include time returned to consumers, which might allow more work time, increased leisure time, such as sleeping, reading, or maybe making a phone call. Self-driving cars could also make certain jobs easier, like the school run or late or early journeys. And finally, they could also improve road safety significantly. On a similar vein, automated taxis are assumed to be driving at peak times not charging, and parked cars or fleets could provide generation or absorb renewable energy at other times of day. 
So in 2050, how many will there be and how many miles will they do? In steady progression and owner driver world, there are 3.4 million self-driving cars covering 12,000 miles a year. In leading the way, there are over 1.8 million robot taxis covering 90,000 miles a year, as they're being used all day for commuting, shopping, school runs or other trips. I'm going to close with key messages and key uncertainties. A recap. Hydrogen and electrification are key to the decarbonisation of transport. Even in the lowest and slowest decarbonising scenario, there are no new cars sold with an internal combustion engine after 2040. Total energy demand for road transport falls in all scenarios due to the efficiency of electric motors and fuel cells. Public transport is also important. In needing the way, vehicle to grid could provide up to 38 gigawatts of flexibility from 5.5 million vehicles. This varies significantly by day of year and time of day. For example, at winter peak, we're assuming 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., 19 gigawatts of vehicle to grid might be available in leading the way. Aviation, marine, and rail also require significant change on the road to net zero. Continued use of fossil fuels would require carbon offset. I'm going to finish with the key uncertainties. There are several key factors affecting annual and peak electricity demand. The number of vehicles, how many there are, personal mileage, how many miles we end up doing, and freight volumes, how much stuff are we going to be moving around. Smart charging and vehicle grid timings and adoption levels are uncertain. How will we travel, public transport and micro-mobility trends, as well as working from home? Finally, there is no agreed international net zero decarbonisation pathway for maritime and aviation. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this interesting. I'm now going to hand over to Lauren Moody for questions.